Good afternoon. This is an interview with Georgiana Bob Foster for the Valley Historical Project. The interviewer is Harriet Blockus, and it, she is assisted by Ken Blockus. The date is May uh, 18, 1998, and we are at the Leo Lehman Home, where Georgiana Bob Foster is visiting. We want to thank you for granting us an interview. Georgiana, the material will be used to further disseminate and interpret the heritage of our region. It will be primarily used for educational purposes, but it may also be used in promoting economic development and tourism. And Georgiana, we're just really happy. Uh, this is our second try at this because the picture did not come out with your beautiful self. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to have two takes of you, and we hope this time we, we get a better view of you. Would you give us your name and uh, maiden name and where you were born and when, please? Yes, well, I was born uh, Georgiana Falb on May 15, 1928, uh, and I just celebrated my 70th birthday in Elgin. And I was born, of course, in the Postville Hospital, uh, though my parents, Myrtle and uh, Myrtle Kerr Fobb and George Fobb, of course, lived, lived in Elgin, Iowa. And you want to tell a little bit about your parents? Yes, my, my, um, my, my father was a, a native of Elgin and a, um, from, a fa from a family, uh, the Fobb family in Elgin, that who had, who had uh, lived in the, he was, he was born in 1898, um, and the family had, had, had lived in Elgin then for about for about 20 years, and his his uh, his his grandfather had come from Switzerland, and my mother came from Lime Springs, Iowa, and was uh, she? But she had been teaching in the Claremont schools when she met my father. She was a basket woman's basketball coach, which she was was something that she had done when she herself was in high school, and she was uh, she also taught home economics and had the PE program, and that's the way that she was, she and Gladys Shorey were uh, rooming together in Claremont with the Christian Millers, I think, and they, they used to walk on the railroad tracks down to Elgin to see George and Tad before they got married. Um, they, but my father's, as I said, my, I think, my, I didn't say my father's, my father's family, his grandfather had come from Switzerland with his family in about 1870 and apparently lived up around Raynard and moved to the town about the time my grandfather John Fogg was about 18 and then his father soon died and he became an entrepreneur starting several businesses in Elgin and my mother's uh, and his, his, uh, uh, his wife Mary Walter came from Al Cater and she was a very good cook and had cooked in boarding houses and the hotels and so forth and kept on doing that. And my mother's in my mother's family, her mother had come from Norway at eighteen years old, the only person in her family that came all by herself and her she had gotten married to a man who had come from Denmark when he was about eleven years old with his widowed mother. And they, they were as I said, she was from Lime Springs, although they had first come to Wisconsin. Uh, are there any other things that you want to tell about your early uh, grandparents? Is there, have you talked about most everything that you would like to tell about them? Uh, I think so. I don't know what the occupation, particularly of the of uh, people, were when they when they first. Uh, well, my, my 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 grandfather Kerr was a was a carpenter and. And house builder, and 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 was a cabinet maker, and so forth. And my, um, but my grandfather Fob, then when he came to Elgin as a young man, started went into a was a butcher, and went into business with a Holt, Mr. Holzer, and then bought his his business or did something, got his business, and then started his. Uh, started his meat market business in, in, around the place of the Elgin Park in, in 1893. Then he moved across the street and in 1895 there's something on, from the Elgin Echo that says he was opening a store 
his, his meat market in 1895 in the place now where on, on Main Street where uh, where Leo Fab lives no excuse me it's on, on Center Street right in the middle of, of the business district and the family has has lived there in various forms of whoever has run the meat market um, or the grocery store ever since until it was until my cousin retired from having the grocery store but my grandfather then started selling some of the first automobiles so then he started John Fob and Sons with his sons and sold uh, automobiles for for many years but he also had farms he had a a barn down by where the low-cost housing is uh, in Elgin, uh, near, near to Otter Creek, I think it's on Wa Water Street. And he had a barn with all sorts of livestock. And in the morning, the, his hired man would milk the cow and bring a can full of milk up to his place on, on Center Street and leave this can of milk standing on the steps of his house. And it was my job to go and get the can of milk and bring it home. And my mother would would strain it into a big crock and getting out much kind of grit and different kinds of barn dirt and straw <laughs> and then we would drink it <laughs> drink it raw and we had a lot of not of nice cream on it so he had a lot of of enterprises during world war ii then i think he sold farm machinery and so then his his son his grandson robert fobb then had the implement business his sons uh, at various times considered continued with the with uh, the John Fobb and Sons in both Postville and later in West Union, and the and the the uh, meat market passed from his son Herbert to his grandson Leo, and so there were several Fobb businesses in town when I was a child. There were just a lot of Fobbs of my family around. In even, town. even when I came in the fifties, then Leo's meat market was, you know, everybody knew he had good meat. Yes, that's right. And I right. think Dr. Wolf always got his kosher meat through him, too. I yeah, I don't know whether he got kosher meat, but he got various kinds of things that would be uh, kind of Yiddish in the way things that people would get in New York and Chicago that were Jewish because they, were, they enjoyed all the things about head cheese and uh, meat called head cheese and freshly ground hamburger and very good cut, cuts of meat, rye breads, you know, pickles and, and um, all the kind of things that went along with the good German good German delicatessen things. Right. Uh, and that place mm -hmm. now is not a store anymore, anymore. and it is uh, uh, an apartment. Yes, yes. Well, se several apartments. In which is the part of the store, the store is, uh, the, the store is part of the, um, is now an apartment. That's right. And is rented out for various things. Uh, so you would really say that the Fobs really did a lot to give business to Elgin in the 40s, 30s? Uh, yes, it was always my father's motto that you were supposed to be to buy everything locally and all of the merchants and the merchants' families and everything were supposed to, to, uh, to support each other and the main thing was keeping business good in, in your town in, drawing people and having things that they wanted to come for. It's too bad we don't still do that in the 1990s, getting near the year 2000 with the automobile goes. People buy everywhere instead of always supporting each other so that we could have more local businesses that really cuts down on our business. Yes, it's a very, a very, <laughs> a very, very different um, merchandising thing, but probably during the during the wartime period, of course, people had to go to the closest place that they could, really, for uh, and so really you and I because of gas rationing. <laughs> we grew up thinking we we will get it close in because we yes. had to. Yes, and it worked. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, as the, the bigger stores and Walmart and uh, big furniture marts and Mon Menards and things came, people went. Yes, there yes. was more things to choose from. Mm -hmm. Okay, would you give us, uh, Georgiana, would you give us a little background on your education? Yes, I went, of course, I went to the to the Elgin schools from first grade through, through graduating in 12th grade, and there wasn't any primary or kindergarten at that point, so I started school when I was five years old, and so I graduated in 1944 on my 17th birthday, which helped me to sort of get a, get a head start on what I was going, what else I was going to do. And the, then I went to Upper Iowa for two years, and then I transferred to the University of Iowa in Iowa City uh, and graduated in 49. 
Uh, how big was Upper Iowa at that time? Upper, when I went to school at Upper Iowa in the, in the fall of 1945, it had 75 students, five of which were men. Because there was just, I mean, all the men were, were away in the Army. But there became, by the second year there, there were 150 students and most of them were GIs who came from all parts of the country to go because they wanted to, to get into a college and use their GI Bill right away. And so that made a very great difference. And Upper Iowa had a very hard time because GIs that were 26 years old were not wanting to wear freshman beanies and go to a chapel and every week. And then the first, the first couple that wanted, to get, that wanted to get married were th thrown out of the college and things like that because it was just not... People didn't know how to deal with having older married students in college. <laughs> that was a big difference, wasn't yeah. it? So it was quite a few experience. There were just the, 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 some people that were not eligible to go into the army. Those were the men who were there when I came, and so it was quite a different, quite a different scene the first uh, year. Upper Iowa isn't so big even today, but it's um, they have a big enrollment because they have schools in Des Moines and they have branch in Prairie and they uh, have programs where people can, adults like you and I, mm -hmm. can get degrees yes, without I being on campus. Yes, I understand that they have a very large, a very, very large thing even all, all over the country that that's the way they're doing it, uh, doing things now. Uh, but I graduated from uh, the University of I was a major in sociology, but with a rather broad um, other kind of liberal arts thing. And I was following a suggested curriculum of the Campfire Girls because I thought that I would work for the Campfire Girls professionally when I got. And that was consisted of child development and recreation courses and sociology and and so on. But I, that I had a, a lot of chance to take very, uh, very, very. I think I got a very good, you know, broad, interesting, broad in education at the University of Iowa because of the, the many things. Uh, so let's see. Do you want to discuss? Any, should we go from from now to? Uh, well, you were going to tell us about you got a degree after you. Yes. Oh, yes. Then I got. Then uh, when I when I went to uh, when I left Upper Iowa, I went directly. I was recruited directly from uh, the program of the Methodist Wesley Foundation to go with an experimental youth group of 50 people who went to India for three years, not being uh, um, commissioned really as regular missionaries because of a three-year term was very short, but to be, do some things like the Peace Corps, we, had, we, we were to help in all the various institutions of the mission in India. And it was a, a project that was very much of a type that was used, a volunteer organization that was used when people were, were organizing the Peace Corps that different things that people had done like that. So I learned, I met my husband in India and got, um, who was, a, who was a, an American Quaker who was working there in agricultural work. And after that, we went back to India many times. So about midway between that, about 1973, I started studying for a second, uh, st studying India, Indian studies, South Asian area studies. And in 1989, I got a second BA degree. Indian Studies from the University of Massachusetts Division of Continuing Education through them. Did you ever go to the Taj Mahal? Yes. I went to the Taj Mahal, especially to see it by moonlight, uh, by full moon, in, 19, in May of 1950, and then later in May of, in 1965, I took my son back to see it. But in 1990, in 1990, when we saw it from a distance, it was seeing it through a haze of smog. And they're very much worried about pollution affecting <laughs> Taj I've, I've seen this on television. Yes. It's, 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 it's kind of a big rip. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to um, move back a little bit? And uh, if I would say to you, what are some of your childhood memories? I know there'd be many things. Each time I'd say that, you'd have different things. What would you think of first? Well, I think I would think of living on on what we call Back Street, which is Pleasant Street, and the the neighbors and the particular the the yard with a huge, huge uh, umbrella-shaped 
uh, elm tree and our swing my mother the vegetable garden where we picked all fresh things the vegetable gardens of our neighbors and back of that the cornfield of my that my um, that my grandfather had in all our various activities that were and, and playing in that in that yard and having a having a dollhouse that was made of an old chicken bro I mean a, a playhouse that was made of old chicken brooder house and the um, Working in the working in the garden and and what you did when it was just very very hot in the summer, which I certainly remember in 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 Elgin, and so that when I I was wrapped up, I think in what in the it being pleasantly living in a small town through the seasons, because I know I came across there's a poem I wrote when I was about 14 called My Green Swiss Valley which is very many, you know, a hundred or so lines long, and it's very, in those impressions were a lot about, you know, summer evenings and trying to get cool and about looking up into the hills. And What were some uh, of the things you did to get cool? Well, we, our parents used to take us for a ride in the car at night down various country, country lanes, sort of in the dark up and down with the breeze blowing through the car. No air conditioning. No air conditioning. But they also, my, my family had a sleeping porch, which was all screened in all the way around uh, on the back of their house. And so that was a place that was, it wasn't winterized, but in the summer we would move our, our beds out there, I, I think. And that was, that was as cool, you know, as you would get. And then you would have, have fans and things too. But you, even ice cream, I think when I was very small, we used to run up to the, to, uh, the, to the drugstore, Chuck O'Neill's just directly up the alley from us, and we would bring home uh, malted milks or ice cream, and you'd have to really hurry so they wouldn't melt before you got home. Though we must have had, you know, a refrigerator pretty pretty soon, but it wouldn't have had a freezer. No, it wouldn't. So it wouldn't have had a freezer, so that you needed to get your to get your ice cream cones at the where they sold them. Now you lived on this interesting street, back street, which was uh, the river and the dikes. Mm -hmm. were were on one side of you and then what you called Main Street was on the other only it was Center Street. Street yes and there were a lot of interesting houses on that street would you like to tell us a little bit about, about some that. of the houses yes well on the we had we had very interesting neighbors which are still who are still very very clear to me on the uh, on the on the no we lived about midway in the street and so to the to the north of us the next house was uh, Cecilia and Frank Greenley. And just a minute, uh, who lives in the house now to kind of identify it, isn't it? It's the San San Sanders. Sanders. Yes, the Sanders are the people. And they've just showed me recently the interior of the house, which I've never seen never seen since my since nineteen forty nine when my no, nineteen fifty three. In 1949, I went to India, and I had I'd never seen the inside of the house since. And they changed it a lot, but I could still, you know, tell where what some of the things were about the house. Anyway, the the, the neighbors, the Greenleys, were we called them Auntie and Frank, and they were like an aunt and uncle to us, and always, you know, did a lot of things for us, and uh, let us tease them and see their parrot, which they had, which would say hello when you walked into the house, and so forth. And um, he, Frank Greenley, drove a, a, a standard oil truck delivering gasoline and oil from it. One of the really rather small things compared to what a tank truck is, is like. Nice. And then next to them was Fanny Frieden and her daughter Ida Frieden and um, and Eddie, I think, who lived there. She was an Apostolic Church member who was a widow and a Dutch bottom Swiss person who was a very wonderful seamstress and also took over the the business of the person in Claremont whose name I can't bring up but who was a very famous rag doll maker of a certain kind of doll that was made with a crocheted face and a knitted hat a knitted sort of hat knitted hair and so forth and she she made uh, but but Fanny uh, repaired I think I had a rag doll from the person in Claremont she made us all everybody in my sisters and my I all rag dolls and then she made her mother would my mother would commission her to make the rag dolls a new outfit each season and we would get one for Christmas which had clothes like we did you know formal dresses and 
So the styles of the clothes that I have for that rag doll are very much what were things, the styles of the area. In fact, the, this was, you know, it was crazy to make Barbie doll kind of clothes for a rag doll that was like that, but she did that. Then the... Now, uh, do you still have Yes, I still have my rag doll and, and all clothes. of its clothes, yes. And I took the doll to India with me when I went. And I also took it to Washington, D.C. with me when I was... My parents made a trip there to go and t deliver a car to somebody from Elgin that lived in Baltimore, and so we just drove out there, and my parents and then drove the other car back, and my parents took me with, with it. And this would have went just before the war started in in about April of 1941. World War II. Yes, World War II. And so I took this rag doll, and I have a little book in which I wrote a journal of the trip with pictures of the rag doll standing with me in front of Mount Vernon and so on and so is, forth. So is this book going to be one of the things that you will put in this Iowa women? I think it should be what goes what goes with the doll, wherever the doll is is deposited, because I do, I have another st story, I think I have a story of the trip itself, because I began at a very early age to keep scrapbooks writing about trips that I went on, so I think that... Must be in your family, because Carolyn's <laughs> always making, your sister, sister Carolyn is yeah, making scrapbooks, too. Um, one thing we didn't talk about on the other tape was your neighbor, Bill Miller, Mm -hmm. and the problems he caused with his dog. Yeah, well, yes. Well, Bill Miller was my father's cousin, and he ha he ran the tavern and the pool hall, which is under the opera house. But he had a lot of other occupations. He was a house uh, a wall painter and house painter who was very dilatory, and my mother used to se sometimes was sending me to go after Bill to find out what he was going to do, and I had to go down these stairs into this dark, dungeon of a place that was a wicked place, <laughs> this pool hall that was down under the opera house. But along the side of the opera house, next to Starkelson's garage, he had a lot of kennels with his coon hounds, and the coon hounds howled at night, and my mother was very, didn't like that at all. And I guess he took them out hunting. I don't really know about people, people and coon hunting, but he had a, he was a bachelor who simply had a lot of, of, uh, of, of occupations and they were right along of course the and so this was the back of this the place was uh, a little bit across from us and the and the lot behind the coon hounds was full of the uh, machinery that of uh, farm machinery that the Torkelsons were repairing and storing and in the spring in the summer when they were they somehow stored some of their steam engines for thrashing in the country and so they would have to travel very slowly like steam engines doing up from the country and you could hear them coming a long way off because these steam engines had a very deep puffer belly you know boom, 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 <laughs> down there and then my brother used to go across the street and help uh, Nels Olson repair steam engines and stuff like that and so my brother who then went on to become an engineer did a, had a lot of you know learning learning over there so that was the neighbors across the street from this next uh, to them uh, on which also was this back to back to uh, to main to center street the people were a couple of norwegian farmers who were re bachelors and retired the whole hog boys kettle and someone else, I can't remember the other brother, and my mother used to try to look after them a little bit because she thought they were so, uh, it was so bad, <laughs> you know, that they had to live and do their own cooking and everything, which they had done for their whole lives. But then on the south, no, on the uh, east side was another woman who belonged to the Apostolic Church who was a spinster, Rose Garber, and she also did, did sewing, very meticulous, wonderful sewing for for people. Uh, that's how she made her living and she had a very, very wonderful garden. She grew lots of things behind her house. But one day, as my sister tells it, she looked out the window and saw the men, some men coming in black suits who came to visit Rose. And she thought this was quite unusual. And so she rushed, my sister rushed over to her house as soon as, as soon as she, uh, the men left and Rose said to her, well, you know, Carolyn, I'm going to get married and I'm going to leave because the people had uh, a, a, asked Rose if she was uh, interested, would be, would be willing to marry a widow man in the Apostolic Church in Illinois. And so my sister says she was just really broken hearted because she, Rose had taught her to crochet, you know, to do a lot of things and was always there as a person to listen to. 
And so we, I went to Rose's uh, wedding in the Apostolic Church down in the Dutch Bottom. That was before it was moved into Before town. it was moved into town, the church, the church building that's down there. And that was a kind of... Um, Tell us a little and, bit about that wedding. Yes, I well, I don't remember too much except that it was extremely simple and consisted mostly of their... The two people rose from the congregation and the men and women sat on, on uh, different sides and came to the front and then their their wedding was solemnized in some way by someone as a kind of, of, of lay minister in the front and there wasn't doesn't seem to me there was any music connected with that with that service they didn't they don't use any musical they don't instruments, instruments but no. they do sing and so i don't remember they sing them sing. I, I see that but this then turned out to be very interesting because i got married to uh, I got married to a to a Quaker when I got married in 1954, and he the Quaker weddings are carried on very similarly to that. And the bride and groom walk into the to the to the meeting room by, together and sit on a front bench, and they then say their vows to each other. And there's not any and there's not any music. And, and there's a w meeting for worship on the basis of silence, like like Quakers have. So it's very interesting to me to think back on that kind of wedding, apostolic wedding, because I did have a wedding similar to that when I got married. Did you have a spooky house on your street? Yes, we had a. There was a house on our street, uh, just uh, about three houses uh, west of my family, called the Mattoon House which for some reason or other was a very uh, a very large old frame house where the paint was it was just sort of gray gray with weather beaten things in a grove of pine trees and so it was very if you walked back at, at the night there was nothing except any reflection of light reflection in the windows and and the pine trees were going and things like that so we always tried to avoid walking down we came down another alley from main street and then so we didn't have to walk by it by it at night and i'm not sure i think that i read in the, El the elgin then and now that there was a dr mattoon that moved to south dakota but he died in 1902 and so i don't know exactly the, the family was came back to the house maybe once a year to look after it i don't know why they were why it was left standing does that alone. house still exist no it doesn't that that was it was sometime in when i was in college or something it was it was taken down and there was an auction of very of the interesting contents and i understand that the birds from it were taken to up to the to the to the to the elgin high school the stuffed, oh, bird stuffed cases. birds yeah well i think that i was just told by someone else that they were taken given to the to the to the school it was an auction of the of the house's contents was this the house that had the sun uh, yeah the, the, the sunflower painting when or? i was i the people came back to visit one year and i went to the to the house uh as i remember i had a, a crush somehow they must have stayed a while i had a crush on, a, on one of the boys that came with them from uh from south dakota and so i was wanting to get into the house and i saw these rather large panels panels about this wide and uh, one that were painted with sunflowers and I don't know what happened to them but but we used to think of this as being really a sort of spooky house to to scare you but it had a very deep yard that went but it, their yard was in the back was the nearest to the kind of dikes that had been built I think I see in this book that that the flood that I remember as a child from the river was 1933 and the water came up from the Turkey River through the through our garden in the back, and and very very fast. I can I can remember it just coming through the yard just like that. You could see it moving and going into our basement and flooding our basement very very quickly. So that we went down there in our sandbox and uh, which was stored down there and floated around in it as a little boat, <laughs> which wasn't. I mean, we didn't. We were having fun, but it, it was not fun <laughs> fun for anybody. What ha what happened? To and so after that, they built the first dikes across there. And the people that live live down there in our uh, old house now were showing us where the dikes are. The dikes are in in uh, in moving again, but Elgin has had so many floods that I'm wonder and so many different ways of building dikes. It's really very difficult <laughs> to keep these two streams that come down here from from yes, once in a while. Elgin is surrounded by water on three sides, which yes. is unusual, and mm -hmm. so sometimes they really it causes a lot of excitement in the town mm -hmm. because of this. Um, if I were to, you went to school in the old school, in the original, 
uh, had it been built on to when you? Yes, the high school building was there, and, and okay. all of it it was built as it, as it was when when it was was torn down. I think there may have been some adjustments, you know, inside, but otherwise it was. The do you rem do you have any uh, memories from uh, elementary school? Yes, it, well, elementary school was uh, we we. We would go home for our lunch, and the be the bell would ring for all the different things for dismissal and for when you were supposed to start again. I think it started the bell rang 15 minutes before you were supposed to be there, and then again on the hour. And so we had to sort of scootle home to me about a 10 minute walk down to my house and have a big dinner, and then go scootling back. And we, I, you know, we had a side ache by the time you had run after eating <laughs> so much to come back. And so that, and I I guess that the the people that the high school students who were from the country did brought their own lunch for a noontime for a, for a long time because the hot lunch program wasn't on any time that I was in school. And uh, what you were in this school where it was K through twelve. No, there wasn't K. There, there wasn't, wasn't any K. There was until my sister. Let's see, uh, when I was in the seventh grade, they decided to add a primary, and it wasn't a kindergarten. It was primary because legally to have a kindergarten, they had to do something different. But there was a primary, so then they had the rooms: uh, primary one, two, and three, four, and five, six, and seven, and that left the eighth grade out. Okay. We have the school included uh, first grade through twelfth grade. Yes, and so when I was in the seventh grade, they decided that they would put the eighth grade in with the, with nine through twelve, in the same big assembly hall, and that we would also have our teachers in all classes. And so this was an awful change for us, who weren't really ready for not for being in a self-contained room with one teacher teaching everything. But they they um, they put us in there with sort of without any preparation because that's the only way they could reorganize the rooms to do have it. And so we were in under Miss Crow's tutelage, Agnes Crow, who was a great institution. And the first <laughs> assembly that we had when we were in the school, she got up and she said, someone came to me this morning and said, you know, Miss Crow, you taught my grandmother. And this was because she had taught in rural schools when she was about 16 or 17. And she was about, she was to be, I think, 76 before she retired. And she was a very great disciplinarian in a way that, that would be impossible to imagine. <laughs> Nowadays, she had a little bell like you have in a store, sometimes in old-fashioned stores where you want to get somebody to come to the counter and you go ding, ding, ding with it. So she would go ding, and we turned in our seats, ding, and we stood up, <laughs> and ding, and we all walked forward. <laughs> you, you were ready for the Army. <laughs> yeah, we were ready for the Army. Well, the, yeah, we were ready for... for, for for, for lots of kind of things and we're ready for, for paying attention even when we weren't interested. <laughs> it was one of the things that I learned from sometimes from being in I want to ask, well, did she teach anything? I always hear about her discipline. Did, was, did she teach subjects too? Yeah, she taught history. Okay. And she taught she taught sociolo sociology or social studies, and she really wasn't in psychology and things. She really, that was not a, a really strong point for her. But history was, because she could remember, uh, as a child, the Civil War, and it was really very important to her to, influ to, to tell us how people had fought that war to free the slaves. And that was re she really impressed that on me. And at the time, of course, Claremont had this Civil War park with the cannonballs and the cannons and the Civil War monument and so forth. So this made this come very much nearer to us, I think, because she... Did you, did you ever know that at East that at the East Claremont Lutheran Church they had a quite a discussion about slavery and they took a vote on it. Hmm. What did they, I wonder what, what they voted. The well, about, about whether they should be slave, you know, uh -huh. or against it. Yes, well I think that that was, that was interesting that because people had, so many people in the North lost their lives about that, I think we don't, we forget how, impo how important it was to people fighting that. It's been such a long time since we've had a war on our land. Yes. Thank uh, goodness. Yes. Okay. Um, do you remember any special holidays in school? I mean, any th special thing that you did on holidays yes. or pictures that you had hanging in your classrooms? I, I guess I can remember when we were in, when we were in grade school, we celebrated very, we always had a big a Christmas program. 
and then so I can remember that we would make all of the different things that go with the seasons, you know, jack-o'-lanterns and leaves and pilgrims and the whole bit like that. I can't remember anything we would do in high school, but I do. They had very, very many plays and uh, musical programs that the grade school put on, like uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was one thing I remember that we did. And when I was in high school, we put on a, an operetta that I sang in, though I can't imagine that right now. And I also, at the time, during the time of World War II, I wrote a, an operetta that was, a, that was taking the tunes, some tunes of World War II and, and singing, you know, I left my heart at the stage door canteen and so forth. I don't know what it was about, but they apparently were very flexible as far as putting, I can't imagine that this was very entertaining, but it was, uh, it was great training. And also when I was in high school, uh, Gladys Shorey was my teacher in speech. And there were what was then called dec declamation contests, where you got up and where you were in several, in humorous, dramatic, and uh, poetry reading or something like that. They yet didn't yet have debate. And so you learned these things in which you uh, took the part of the various characters and you learned by heart all of the story that you told, taking the part of various, and then you, then you uh, participated in contests. And so Gladys was a very uh, wonderful, and she was also the English teacher in the high school. A very you tell wonderful us a trainer. little bit about her because someone talked to me just to this morning about how, how you know she was, she always said yes mm -hmm. when people asked her to do mm -hmm. things. Yes, I think she was very. She as I, she was of course my. I had said she was my mother's roommate and my mother's very close friend, and uh, and then they got married in had their children together in Elgin. But she went, unlike my mother, she went back to teaching. And she was, she and her husband, Tad, also were, were very great with the, with the children and uh, with the young people in our church. They had their church choir. And so the choir practice was were a social occasion for the young, for young people with older people, in which after we practiced uh, uh, the hymns for Sunday, we would then sing funny songs like Ab Abu Madu the Boo Boo Amir and all the things from the Golden Song Book. And so that it was great fun. Did and you we, do this at the church or at their house? We, went at, we did it at their house. I can remember laying on my, my stomach in front of their fireplace, roasting marshmallows and just all sorts of things that were connected with the fire. So she was very, and but she had, since she had all these, these plays and drama, she was always involved in uh, de helping people develop, helping the people develop different kinds of skills about, about, about speaking and drama and interesting fun things, you know, like having plays. I don't remember just what other things, yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask, did Tad play the piano? They had that piano in that little alcove. Yes, we had choir practice in an alcove and, and, and Tad would play the piano. It was sort of like a sunburned porch mm -hmm. that went around, and that's where we had choir practice when Tad would play the piano. And Tad, I guess, played in in some other bands and so forth. Uh, he played clarinet so or something. So music has always been played a big role in the history of Elgin. Very in, much in so. In the last, yeah. say, 50 years. That's right. And there was a piano teacher named Barbara Com, who I understand is still alive, yeah. and she came to give I and my sister a piano lessons, you know, after school for when we were in probably about junior high age or something and for several years in high school. And she, so, and she went a, and she went around, she traveled around in all the towns and went to each of everybody's house after school to give them piano lessons. But there was also, there was a very, very, the, the wonderful music teacher in, the, in grade school was Lula Francisco. And uh, she was, uh, she was the most, you know, just wonderful, <laughs> cheery and wonder, wonderful person in teaching. She taught the music of all the grade school, and she also taught high, high school music. So this was something that I don't, my children don't have in Massachusetts with somebody that's coming to sing with them every day that's the music teacher. And we, we used to, on Friday, we got to sing our favorite songs from the 100 Golden Book of Songs. And so we, we very much like to sing Civil War songs, like when Johnny comes marching home and just before the battle mother and so forth. I don't know why, why, but so I remember her most because she came into our fifth and sixth grade classroom one morning and told, had to be the person that told us 
that our teacher had died during the night. She had a brain tumor, which they didn't know about. Who it had to mitten. tell about it? Lula Francisco oh. had to come and tell the children that Mrs. Lindem Miss Lindemann had died in the night in her sleep. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I can remember, still see her face coming into the classroom and having to tell these children this, which was a great shock to everyone. Were any of your elementary teachers married? No. No, that was true. I tell a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I guess, well, in those days, people could not be, be, be married and, and be teachers because it was felt they were taking, either that they were taking jobs away from men or they, not that men were elementary teachers, but they would, they were, that was their place was in the home when they got, they got married. And it wasn't until the war broke this thing that, that they needed more, needed more teachers, I think, or some of the high school t teachers were, were perhaps allowed to be married, but. When they got married, they they uh, weren't, weren't. But the uh, but this is right. Music was a very great. Well, thing one in the thing schools. I know we talked about the music on the other tape, so uh, I would like to. We didn't talk about the road. What were the roads like between Claremont and Elgin, and between here and Gunder, and between here and West Union? And did that have any influence on why maybe you didn't go shopping a long ways away? Yes, it certainly did. There were no paved roads into Elgin, and there were, um, I don't know whether they even put on some, that even changed to being a gravel instead of dirt on the road to, um, between Claremont and Elgin. It was always you went, if you wanted a shortcut but a more dusty road, you went the short, the short road up to West Union. But if you were going or wanting to go around by some well, somewhat more hard surface roads, you went to Claremont. But the, um, and the, the roads within town were all dirt when I was a child. And so they put, every spring, they put a layer of used motor oil that they spread on them to, to keep down the dust. And before that, they had used a watering truck that went around watering, uh, putting water on the, on, the, uh, on the roads at night, I mean in the evening, to settle the, to settle the dust for the, for the next day. Did your family ever <coughs> own horses? My, my, no, my father used to deliver mail using a horse at sometimes. He was somehow, before he became a postmaster in 1924, or sometimes he went out and when it was very, when the roads were very, very muddy, he used to take a, he used to take, use a horse, I think. But the neighbors, I think, had quite, quite recently had horses because across, we could see from our house across the back of Main Street, everyone had a barn because they had recently had had horses, but as I was growing up, there was no use. Those barns were beginning to be completely unused, and it was mostly a uh, somewhat a place for for uh, lovers to go. In the barns was one of the traditions. And now we have barn tours because yes. the barns are disappearing, yes. and yes. people want to see them before they're entirely gone. I think most of them that are that are within Elgin, I've been. That are in my childhood memories, at least, have been torn down because no one did. And they used to. It reminds me that around the school, in the uh, there was a there was a barn right next to north, uh, no w west from the school. In the next lot was a big barn and a big uh, cattle yard of some kind. And so, and also, and there was a field for corn down below between the Otter Creek and the school. And so, of course, in the in the spring they would spread manure on this, and there would be manure in this thing. And so we used to say, "Fresh country air scented by with gardenias." <laughs> and all <this> started, <laughs> when, this, when all this started coming up in the spring, I mean, nobody was was worried about the fact that, in fact, one of the things we used to do in the schoolyard to play was to rake up leaves into little piles along the fence rows and we would make little walls and everyone would make a house in which they were, the girls would make a house for playhouse that they would leave from day to day and each time you went out to recess you would go out and play. And you mean you would rake the leaves? We raked the leaves a wall. and we made a little a little wall like this. We did that too. We you always, did? Yes. Oh, we well made playhouses. Was, that was know. a real tradition then. And that. you know, our even our children used to go to their uh, Grandma Olga's, and they had a big tree that they made playhouses with. I yeah. don't think kids do that no, nowadays. No, no, But you would you would rake up stuff and make walls, yes, and then that's you could right. go doors, and you could walk from one room, room to, to the another, other. Yeah. So uh, we had to use our imagination, Mission. didn't we? Yeah, this is, that's right. But they did did, did this at the school. Uh, and uh, uh, did 
did they ever did we have a jail yes the jail the jail which was just a sort of um, cage like thing was in the back of the um, of where the where the farm fire truck was or the town fire truck which was in the row of there was John Fobb and Sons in the town hall and then this little little side place which became part of the library which at some point it had I don't know when they took that out of there, but there was a little jail cell in the back of that. And uh, my father was the mayor for 14 years, and so in the in the Saturday night dances at the opera house, when people got drunk and when his marshal wasn't taking care of it, he had to go and see that some people were put in the put in this jail in order to sober off for the, sober up for the uh, for the next morning. But my father was also for a time the farm fire chief. And he used to, you know, the whistle would blow, and he would go on and get get on this truck in the in the clothes that he was wearing at the office, and go out to the fire. And my mother used to complain because he got fire extinguisher fluid on his good hands. <laughs> so it was sort of informal. I can't see how they would man manage to be of much much use, but it was a tank of water, I suppose, to to drive out out to, or a pumper of some kind. I don't know really what kind of a, a fire truck it was. Uh, as you were growing up in Elgin, if you, uh, as a small child, was there any particular house in Elgin that you thought, oh, when I grow up, I would like to buy that or own that house? I don't know. I guess there were houses that were that were bigger um, and better, but I don't I don't remember particularly. That, of having yeah, any desire. Of, of having any desire. My parents had a, had a house that had indoor plumbing, which was not common in, in, with, among any of our neighbors, nor among many of my classmates. People had, people had priv privies. They had, I guess they had, they might have water in their house. Maybe it was pumped from a cistern outside. Or there was city water, I guess, after was a while. Was there any springs in Elgin? In the, the hills there in, were, but were there the any in Elgin? I don't remember any springs within Elgin, though I do remember them in the various places out, uh, around we would go to pick watercress and there were there were special places just you know to stop and drink water and at Shorey Springs on the way to Claremont uh, before you get to the school and, and and one at the base of the Kern Hill so forth that there. What uh, did you do for entertainment when you were young? When I was when I was in before I was in high school and even when I was in high school, uh, it was clubs. It was a club like the camp was the Campfire Girls was one of our big Campfire Girls the, played a big part. Well, they in your that life. played a big part in my life, and the um, so but and there wasn't too much else for there wasn't a lot for for young people to do, and we we you could go to movies in Elgin and I mean movies in Postville. Or in West Union, and when the but when the war came along, and I was in high school, it was very difficult to do that because of gas rationing. But we did try to get there quite quite often. There were infrequently, sometimes I guess there must have been movies in the opera houses, and there were some when I was a very small child. I remember people giving plays in the opera house because it had a lot of scenery flies that were on the stage of the, of the opera house. But I think that was only when I've read of that in scrapbooks. About about my pit, my father doing that, but I think that was a little bit fading out by the time I was. So there wasn't uh, a, a a lot of things for it, a lot of kinds of of parties and things that I can remember. People, I mean, church, mm -hmm. you know, church choir, the choir breaks. I mean, within within my thing and the. Um, if you were the, going to travel when you were a child, what would you consider a big trip? Well, we often went to Chicago. Because we, my 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 father did business in Chicago, and his sister, Marie uh, Fab uh, Morris, lived in Chicago, and so a big trip was going to Chicago on the Zephyr. Did you, where did you catch that train? We went to Prairie du Chien, and it was really exciting, and it was really a good train, even compared to any trains that there are now nowadays, because that train would stop very, uh, very, very shortly. You had to. Put your foot on and get on while it started, and before you were had your you were into the car, it started again because Perdichine was a stop for not for uh, that was very short. 
But I think we wrote on the Zephyr and when it was really quite new, because I can remember us going and how, how much excited we were, because it went so fast that it's swayed from side to side and of course eating in the dining car and everything was a you real You still event. can take a train from Prairie to yeah. Chicago. Yes. Because uh, I know some people that do that. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever ride on a train that came, that stopped in Elgin? No, I didn't. Though I once was taken by bus when I was five years old. I was taken by bus to Kelm. I went. No, I was not. But taken. I was put on the bus and into the care of the bus driver. Now, where did you get on the bus? In, in Claremont. To, in, in Claremont. Claremont. Okay. In Claremont. I got on the bus because because again because we, Elgin didn't have a paved road. You know they were off they were off the map of all kinds of things like that and. Um, which people blamed on politics, the, us not having a road, road, road through Elgin. And we went, I went, so I went on the bus to Calmer, and then I was met by some of uh, Gladys Shorey's relatives. It, it, was, it was either Calmer, Calmer or Cresco, I think it was Calmer. And then they put me on the train, and I rode for about a f just a very few miles to Lime Springs, Iowa, where my grandfather met me. And I was very disappointed because the train went so slow. <laughs> I expected it, I, you know, the, to really be on, but my grandfather met me. And then I stayed a week with my grandparents in Lime Springs. And then I don't know, I think my parents probably drove up to get me or something. They just wanted me to have this experience of, of, of going on the train. But I don't, and I, oh, and I remember the freight trains whistling and coming through Elgin, but I don't remember anything about passengers coming to Elgin. Uh, can you tell us anything about the Elgin Cemetery? Uh, there were the, um, mainly I, d I don't remember much about going to any, any internments, in the, in internments in, the, in the cemetery, but I remember the Memorial Day services that were held there when everyone would march up sometimes from downtown in the bandstand and you would have a reading of um, all of the people that, from, that had been killed in the Civil War and, in, and at that point in World War I. And they would then uh, by the by some kind of monument that there is to the to, to the soldiers and probably the Civil War monument there and then the all the veterans that had marched in the parade and had guns would all shoot off a volley of with their with their rifles and then uh, probably Gordon Mosby or someone would play taps on there I think he played taps on his cornet. And often I was, and so I can remember, what I remember most about the cemetery is walking down this road between all the pine trees and in, in the cemetery that for Memorial Day. And then, of course, no, it was then called Decoration Day, as of the Civil War things of decorating everybody's grave. And it, it was, was uh, yeah. on the 30th of May. And it was always on the 30th of May, not like, like it is now. And so we would always say, well, we hope we had lilacs for Memorial Day. And of course, this year the lilacs have been in and gone for for uh, for two weeks, but it was very important to it was very important to your family's reputation to properly decorate the family's graves. And that has changed, of course, with many people moving far away from their relatives. I think that is right. Though my uh, my 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 cousin and my aunt still go to to Lime Springs, Iowa, from Mason City every year to put to put flowers on the graves and of the of the Kerrs and. In Lime Springs, it is a way to observe history. Yes, it is a way. When when my, when all of my my cousins had a reunion in 1996, we all went up there and walked around. And the older ones of us told, and the ones of us that are more <laughs> interested in genealogy told the other ones who these people were, whom they had no idea. And because you can't always tell, because the grave sites aren't marked as well, people weren't didn't have enough money to make things. Um, we haven't talked about the canning factory. Yes. What are your memories of the Elgin canning factory? Well, uh, I I mostly remember when I worked there just very very briefly during during World War II, just be between high school graduation and college, because they were very very short of people, and of course people would go the they would the corn came into the factory. It was in big uh, wagon loads. Sometimes I think then with horses and was dumped, it went onto a belt, people stood by the belt, they picked off corn cobs that weren't good, they went to the, then uh, through the wa a washer that went around, uh, went upstairs to the third floor where people husked it, and the 
rock horn came down and was cooked in a big vat. And I worked in the place where we put cans on, empty cans on tracks with big rakes. And they went rattling, rattling, rattling down and went through the, through, went through the canning machine uh, to be filled and, and to be filled and then capped with, with corn. And it was very pr pr pretty exciting. And people would work, the whistle would blow when they got in enough corn and we would work 10 hours if that was what was necessary for. And we were all very, very tired, but we were making 50 cents an hour. And so it was really wonderful, <laughs> wonderful money as far as the one, ones that was mature. In fact, I went late to college with the five people that went from my class to college because we were needed to, to, work, needed to work at the canning factory. But it was very, very, the, the whole town was involved in it when the canning factory And it paid, running. like, I remember it paid for my, some of my college yes. education, mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of parents, uh, the wives, that was the only time they worked was in the canning factory and helped get the children into school, bought clothes and books. Yes, yes, and and I, yes, it was very important to the in, income of, of people that it had to do, to do, do as, a, as a seasonal income where both the husband and wife would work and, and everyone was... Uh, and, the, and we were unloading the cans from the boxcars with big rate. We would sit in the middle of the back. And there was, of course, an art of taking them off of the bottom so that the whole thing wouldn't fall down. And I you know, learned a great deal about some kinds of things about working in a factory and stuff. It <laughs> wasn't very skilled, but it was not very skilled labor. We worked in the, in the, uh, sort of out in the warehouse where they were also bringing all the cans corn to be to be put in boxes and labeled. Are we getting close to the end? Mm -hmm. Not much left. I wonder, do you remember them uh, canning anything besides the corn? No, they weren't canning anything but, but corn. When they, but they did can for several different companies. And so that later in the winter, they would have the labels of all these different companies that they that they labeled corn for. And they would get, they would then in the winter would be the time that they got all of them the corn labeled and everything. And so my father would always get a case of this corn and we used it for making, uh, uh, we had it for things. But it was a sort of soupy, <laughs> soupy corn compared to anything that you would think of as being whole corn of corn. I mean, they made corn, cream, cream, style. Cream, style, cream style corn that had a lot of water in it, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we used to get cases of that even after I came here and it was pretty good. Yeah, it wasn't that. And then so we would get cases that were unlabeled, you know. So yeah. then you had when you had them around the house, a can without a label, you knew that that was was uh, was corn from the Elgin canning factory. You know, it seemed to me like a great. I, I think I brought my brought my one of my sons to visit this canning factory yet, and after he was born in 90, he was born in 1959. In fact, I don't think I've said I have two sons, one born in 1959 and one in 1968. Um, if, if in kind of closing, do you have any other things that we have missed that you would like? You just suddenly remembered, oh, I never talked about this or that. Uh, I think that it's much, uh, what, what is most, uh, what sum up things most is that I, in saying that I still take the Elgin Echo, and I have, for, for 40 or 45 years and because every week I read about what some of my relatives are doing and I also you know keep up with interesting things like what the historical society is doing because it means a, uh, a lot more for me sometimes I'm sometimes I'm looking at it more from the point of view of an anthropologist mm -hmm. but uh, there's also things like if you if you ever hear Garrison Keeler and the Lake yeah. Wobegon stories, the first ones that he used to tell when he started were just absolutely described Elgin because they described what people do <laughs> and it just was incredible how, how close that was and I think that's one of the main things is that one of, his, one of yeah. my favorites is when he tells about how the people who live away like you uh -huh. don't want anything changed <laughs> in the town <laughs> before I mean, they want to keep it just the way it was mm -hmm. and uh, we always enjoy that. Yeah, well, all these things about the unknown Norwegian and the bachelor farmer Norwegians and, and so forth. Since it was supposed to be a, a Norwegian Norwegian community, that's it's very interesting, although it's not, some of those things are not exact. But the things that people do, you know, could do, be duplicated in my experience in telling stories about people having the uh, their uh, 
some kind of wedding reception in their new, no, having a, ever having a reception to inaugurate their new hog barn. Yeah. I mean, there's things I could never explain to any people that I know in or Massachusetts about what they were barn. doing. Yes, and, and, and so I think that that kind of thing about people being very close and sort of in each other's hair in a way in which I didn't like when I was a child could never get away from your own family's reputation. They, no one ever would let you be an individual. You were always belonged to such and such who did such and so. But you, so people went had to go away to be become a, an individual their own on their own, their own person. To I be think. their own person. If you, uh, if you had the opportunity, would you move back to Edmonton? Yes, uh, I think that there's probably not because I, I because of the fact I wouldn't move away from where I've lived with my husband all our married life uh, where we're all our friends and our uh, our Quaker church in fact we are we're speaking that we don't really want to move away to a retirement community because we would be leaving our friends and our activities and then so it would be more or less for that not because I not because I particularly didn't want to move back to Elgin and um, is there have we covered just about everything I think so I can't remember what we what we said the other day and what we were saying now, but anyway. Well, some of the things we, we have covered, repeated, we, but a we, lot yeah. we've added a uh, lot of different things, and mm -hmm. that's really good. And we really appreciate you doing this the second time. You're the only one that has <laughs> to do that. To you are unique. <laughs> so I guess we will say goodbye God, to you. you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.